All right, let's get going, guys. V Gates, baby. Hey, how's it going? We're yeah. Yeah. Hey. Yet welcome. one more great podcast. Isn't this fun? This is fun. This is good. I love it. I like your shirt you guys too. I should grab one of those. Yeah. You know, they, 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 yeah. These guys. Do you guys recognize the guy? Yeah. Right whatever. To my yeah. left, your right. He just has <laughs> changed. All right. What All right. Is, today, is everyday picture day now? What's uh, going on? It's everyday picture. Hey, how's it going, guys? <laughs> hey, welcome, welcome, Thank welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, we're here to talk about sustainability today. Yeah, uh, it is a hot, hot topic, I guess. Uh, yes. You know, um, once people get to the point where uh, they're making money, um, yeah. then they are really starting to talk about uh, how to make their operations uh, with a lower carbon footprint and uh, yeah. less VOC and less waste generation. So this is what we're going to be talking about today. It's pretty exciting because oftentimes you can um, save a lot of money by doing all these things. Absolutely. There is a lot of reason to get or to reduce your carbon footprint. And sometimes you get credits for that yeah. as well. And you're uh, contributing to the great institution of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which they're trying to uh, achieve by the t year 2032. All right. That's what we are, we're all about here. So, I mean, we do have, you know, I just, this was kind of sparked by an article that I had read uh, just recently. Um, it was a university in Colorado who had uh, published a study and where they, uh, they mapped out which uh, farms or which grow houses were the most energy intensive. Wow. And of course, it, it, the most energy intensive place was Michigan, um, uh, Illinois, uh, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And then, um, and then everywhere else was really great. So <laughs> <laughs> there must have been a lot of assumptions, but there weren't any assumptions actually in the, in the article. But, but there was a really pretty graphic. It was really looking good. Well, they also talk about, you know, when you get into sustainability and energy and, you know, some of those things. They t also talk about uh, methane reduction. And I don't know, I read an article that said that uh, I think what is the state animal in Norway, I think is the moose. Yes. And the EU has requested that they di diminish the population of moose because the moose uh, produce the most methane. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about cows? I guess, I don't know. Uh, there what are about more cows, moose right? than cows in Norway, I apparently. See. I guess so. Well, lots of cows in Switzerland, but of course they're not a part of the EU, right? So, Truth. Uh, yeah. yeah. But so there's lots of cows. I thought that was funny. You so, drive so around on the, on the hills in, <laughs> in Switzerland. It's very odd because you look up the hill, okay, and there's a cow standing up there. And if that cow fell, it would fall on top of you and you <laughs> would die. It's yeah. not, not, but those, those cows, they really know what they're doing. They're, <laughs> they can climb. They're better mountain climbers yeah. than probably I am. So. Yeah, and those cows, they have these big, you know, horns that go like this right? <laughs> no those are oh. no, those are those are goats oh my gosh those are mountain sheep okay <laughs> well so anyway we're going to talk today a little bit about um <clears throat> a little bit about sustainability um a couple different things you need to think about when you think about sustainability yeah. uh, obviously you want a sustainable business uh model right Absolutely. i mean that you have to start there look if you and don't that have means profit yeah. revenue is is the top line profit you want to do everything toward profit and part of that profit comes in from reducing your costs yeah and so c the question is can you build that in so you're ha you're operating at the lowest cost Big possible up. from the very beginning absolutely have you taken a look for example at the energy usage Pink. of your of what you're trying to do i yep. mean if you have uh are you trying to um, you know, take hundreds of gallons of, of a liquid and, and break it down to minus 40 degrees. Okay, that would be a question yeah. that you should ask because that's very energy intensive, right? Huge, hugely okay. intensive, yeah. Um, you know, what, what kind of carbon footprint f for your organization are you looking to, you know, establish? Are you looking for a negative carbon footprint? It is possible to have a negative carbon footprint, yeah, or are you are you going to be one of those evil ones with a very large carbon footprint? Yeah. And when you have a negative carbon footprint, just so you know, there is a market out there to to sell your negative CFs out there. There is a market for that. That's cool because there are people who need it because they don't know how to offset it, right? As well, and then there's uh, obviously from the standpoint of waste generation. So we're going to kind of hit 
each one of those topics in 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 uh, sequence. Carbon here. footprint, energy usage, waste generation. Yeah. So let, let's start with, let's go. with the carbon footprint one. I mean, um, I just made up some little notes here. We're taking this, a little cheat sheet. Right. Right? I see that, and so. it's it's on a table. Just so you guys know, <laughs> it is on a table. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> on his iPad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's hastily written, but I thought it'd be good, good for us to take a look at. So we think about the carbon footprint of, of say, CO2 mm -hmm. or ethanol or whatever you're producing in terms of your prod uh, production products. Um, you really need to think about, first of all, how much uh, carbon it took to uh, you know, make the actual material itself. Mm -hmm. So like ethanol, how many BTUs did it take to make your ethanol? How many BTUs sure. did it take to make your butane? How many BTUs did it take to make your CO2? And then uh, once, once you have that, um, you know, you need to understand how you're going to use that in your process, right? Does everybody know what a BTU is out there? Oh, British thermal unit. A British thermal unit. That's a good so point. Yeah. Just want to. Well, bring you it have. Back. I mean, people ha understand that you know from their furnaces, right? I mean, if they have yeah. a, if you have a furnace, they usually they they rate them in BTUs, a hundred thousand BTU. Yeah. That's a that's a pretty yeah. big furnace, right? Yeah. And what they're saying is that they are, when you burn on uh, natural gas or when you burn propane, you are uh, generating that amount. I think it's per hour, right? Yep, yeah, absolutely. something like that. So yep. you're 100,000 BTUs per hour. So the so. bigger the heater, the bigger the chiller, the bigger ev all of that, it will right. create those BTUs, and you need to know. Right. So one thing that you need to think about when you're talking about carbon footprint is um, we, ha we had one customer who um, took their CO2 effluent from, in other words, their CO2 waste or their CO2 venting, mm -hmm. and they put it out into their grow. Um, and they turned off all of their uh, gas propane uh, CO2 generators. And that, that was pretty cool because you're taking basically something that would have been vented, you're plowing it back into biomass and therefore creating a negative situation with your carbon. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so that, that actually happened. Uh, that was a customer that we had in Canada, in fact. Wow. And it worked, worked out pretty well. I mean... Um, you know, th that would mean that you wouldn't have zero emissions. Now, the CO2 that you buy right now, for example, is, um, is reclaimed uh, from via membranes and things like that from uh, natural gas. So it's, a, it's like an energy, it's like an industrial byproduct. Mm -hmm. And usually the carbon uh, credit is basically given right at that point because they're recapturing the CO2. Okay. And when you use CO2 in a process, typically, you know, you're, you're letting out maybe 10 or 15 pounds per, per run typically okay, sure. of, of that, of that CO2 out into the atmosphere. So if you are putting that into your grow, um, you know, you're basically, you know, constantly emitting that CO2 into your grow and that way it can be negative. Sure. If you're just putting it out into the, um, atmosphere, that's also okay. It's also considered to be carbon neutral because the the credit has already been paid for at the you know basically when they took the natural gas out. Sure. It's, it's, it's a byproduct of the natural gas. Okay. Or it's a byproduct of propane or whatever. So. So it's zero or negative. Zero or negative. Yeah. On CO two. Yeah. That's huge. But yeah. With. Now, the ethanol, on the other hand, uh, or the butane, the butane also is a byproduct, and they, it's a very low intensive energy process to, to really take it, um, but usually when you emit it, it's called a VOC, so okay. when you're doing your purging operations mm -hmm. or, um, you know, when you, you, have your, you have your oils here and you're trying to get the butane out, most of it you recover and use it again and again, but sure. you're always... Yeah, it was just like ethanol. There's always some left over, right? Yeah. Left over, first of all, in the um, material itself, and yeah. then it's also left over in the oil itself. Yeah. And then you got to purge it out with vacuum and things like that to get that out. So that's called residuals. and um, Which we've talked about many, many times. Right, yeah, we've talked about residuals a lot. But, yeah, so the butane is, is one of those uh, things I don't really... I don't really know the the numbers on how much butane is used and how much butane is emitted, but it's significant. Yeah. Um, and actually, I don't know how um, when they do the calculations how butane really is accounted for in the carbon in the carbon footprint. And if any of you know that out there, you know, throw it up. Uh, yeah. Just introduce that to to us so yeah, that we that we great. can put that in our calculations. Right. Yeah. So um, you know how these calculations are made. You can go to um, uh, like NOAA is a good um, you know resource for that they've NOAA. done yeah they've done uh, national build an arc 
what is it, natural, right. national, <laughs> what, um, ocean and air, uh, aeronautics association. No, no. Yeah. Is yeah. that what it is? And okay. Yeah. They do the weather and, and ocean, oceanic stuff. So aeronautic yeah. Association. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, then you got the ethanol. The, the issue with ethanol is it's very in energy intensive to make It is because you typically it's coming from corn. So you have to do that, that big process to make it. So yeah. there's a lot of energy expended. A lot of energy, a lot of water. Yeah. A lot of um, there was a couple of studies that came out of Stanford where they calculated the amount of energy it took to make one gallon of ethanol. And basically it's 53,956 BTUs per gallon. Holy crap. <laughs> That's a lot. 53,956 BTU for one gallon. For one gallon. Yeah. Of ethanol. And CO2, it's zero or negative. Right, because it's recovered. It's already yeah. been made. So, yeah, there's something associated with that. So that's kind of an energy usage thing. Um, and I guess it wouldn't really um, contribute to your carbon footprint that much uh, if you, you know, if, as long as you don't burn it, right? If yeah. you're using it, uh, using it again and again and Reusing. again and recycling it, yeah. you're, you're not adding any carbon to the, um, you know, to the atmosphere. So that's actually a pretty good... Um, standpoint in use you're not at you know doing a lot of carbon but um but but in your energy is pretty high to actually cool it down and heat it up and cool it down and heat it up so that's yeah. one thing and then to actually make the ethanol it's also really energy intensive yes. in terms of the number of btus and that know. and that hurts you so when the carbon footprint police show up yeah well, when they when they look at the uh, and they do the calculations of what the carbon is, yeah, th they or, or where what their carbon footprint is, that would be one of the factors that take into account. Yeah, one of the things that I'm seeing because the you know the World uh, Health Organization and the United Nations are pushing hard to get to carbon footprint neutral, yeah, at least, yeah, and heading in that direction. So what I'm seeing is a lot of larger ethanol uh, processors um, adding CO2 to their mix. So that they can okay. get that offset. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it does make sense. So then the other thing would be energy use. I guess mm -hmm. we could kind of go into that Absolutely. a little bit. Yeah. Um, so how much energy does it take to uh, run, a, run a CO2 piece of equipment? Very little. How much? So tell me. You, you must know, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on the size, depends on the run, depends on how long you're going. Right? I think it's... Uh, okay, so... At least the the 140 machine that we run, I know that if you if you're running that under the energy draws right around uh, 23 amps, so 23 amps at 208 volts per okay. per yeah, so per it's uh, it's pretty low. It's like um, that's it's like running a uh, a small air compressor essentially, yeah. something along yeah, those well, lines. Yeah, one of those that even one of those that'll clean your <laughs> patio. Yeah, I think that uh, when we did the calculations, we compared the watts. So what you need to do, you take volts times amps, and that equals watts, okay? And then you compare the watts needed to run a CO2 machine versus the watts needed to run an ethanol machine. Sure. And the, the watts needed to run an ethanol machine, you, ha you really have, let's say you got 10 gallons of liquid with the heat capacity associated with that, mm -hmm. which is the, the heat capacity of ethanol. Um, and then you, uh, and then you, you calculate the m number of watts to reduce it down to minus 40 because you're doing cryo, you know, sure. cryo. Yep. And then, um, I don't know if you, there's no heating. I think you just let it warm up. I don't uh, yeah. think you think yeah. you do that. So, yep. but I think it's, uh, when I did the calculation, it was about 70 X difference in the number of watts. That's huge. Uh, per unit time. Yeah. So. So, um, and that's why, and we've talked a lot about the operational cost between ethanol and CO2 yeah. processing. and it That's one CO2, of the key factors associated yeah, with that. That's, yeah. a, that's a very key factor in that, is that energy. Well, and also that's the, the, that really touches on the sustainability side, too. Yep. I mean, because if you're going to, you know, if you're going to have an operation that's sustainable, you're going to try to select the different, um, you know, pieces of equipment that have the lowest power um, possible, right? Yep, absolutely. So the other thing that's really quite energy intensive is the ethanol recovery process, yes. which is very energy intensive. Oh so if you have, um, you know, if you have, you have to basically take the fluid from minus 40 degrees all the way up to uh, in close to the boiling point. Right. Okay. Of, of that. Of ethanol, right? <coughs> and then, you know, put either whether you do that in a rotovap or you do that in a falling film. Yeah. 
um, you still have, there's a lot of energy there. So you're talking, you know, um, yeah, you're talking you know, about, you, you know, basically, a lot of time yeah. Plus you have to do it again and again. So, you know, when, when we do that, it's a, say 40 gallons per hour or something like that. Yeah. What you're really talking about is uh, basically about 60 kilowatts yeah. uh, just to heat it up and to recover it. Yeah, because it's, it's going to be five gallons, roughly, yep. in four and a half hours right. on a 20-liter rotor valve. Right. Right? Right, right. And so that that is significant energy. Yeah, it's a lot. So something that you need to think about if you want to really reduce your energy footprint um, you really need to get into the heat transfer. So really, yeah. and you look at, you know, what are all the, what the heat, what is the energy usage of each of the pieces of equipment? Now, yep. w interestingly enough, when you go in to build your facility, um, you know, your HVAC person is going to ask you for all this oh, information. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to say, because they need to wire it up. And then they're also going to want to know what the heat loss is in the room. So they have enough, you know, um, basically yeah. enough, you know chilling capacity on the on their air conditioner system AC, to yeah. dump all the heat in the room yeah so um you know there's like heat losses associated with each of the pieces of equipment so um you know one of the things that the, the lower the watt requirement the lower the energy requirement for each of the pieces of equipment the lower the losses yep. the lower the uh cooling and heating requirements are in the yep. in the building so it's a, it's a really, it is a virtuous cycle in terms of energy use and yeah. reduction in thereof. And the other thing is like with a typical rotovap or uh, falling tip, you've got, uh, t typically you're uh, emitting a lot of that heat into the room too. Yeah, it's all, in, it's all going in the room. And that's uh, also if you, if you use water, like a lot of people use water in their, in oh, their yeah. rotovap, rotovap bowls. Sure. So that, that's going to produce a lot of humidity in the room, which yep. also has to be dumped, you know, yep. obviously by your HVAC system. Which takes more energy. Which takes more energy. So I think you really need to take a look, at, and your engineers will help you. We do that. We, we, you know, if you hire us to look at your facility. Yeah, we look at all yeah, that. Yeah, we, we have, we take, here's all the equipment. Here's the watts uh, for each of those uh, pieces of equipment. Here's the, um, here's the energy load or the heat loss yep. or the heat loss from each of the equipment. Here's the watt. Uh, here's the watt density that's uh, being added to the room, and then we, then we, th that those uh, calculations are then um, given to the HVAC person that does the air exchanges and all that stuff for each room. Yeah. So, and then you tell them, hey, okay, I want this room to be positive pressure relative to the other room or whatever. Yeah, and that's that's where. So the just like anything, from. I mean, there there are businesses right now that go into big manufacturing facilities or um, industrial facilities or office built complexes where they'll put in equipment that reduces energy usage, energy flow right. by you know t as much as twenty to forty percent. Right, and then they. They, they pay to put that in and it costs them, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars right. or half a million dollars, but, but they're getting, you know, 20 to 40 percent of that, uh, right. half of that energy savings. Right. And I mean, you do this, you they amortize that over time. I mean, the same thing, with the, I mean, growers do this, obviously, with LED lights yeah. versus sodium, yeah. uh, high intensity sodium lights, right? I yeah. mean, they, they do that. They, they use LED. They're more expensive. I don't know exactly yeah. how much, you know, 10x more expensive and then. You know, so you're you're, um, you know, spending another million dollars, and then, and then hope hopefully you'll recover that over time. <coughs> yeah, because you, you have to amortize that over time, and there are a lot of credits to make that happen because you're using less. Well, also also the there's less heat uh, being generated exactly. than from a sodium intensity out. lamp. So then, yeah, you don't have to cool. You don't have a big of a cooling bill. So yep. a lot of that stuff you really need to um, really understand when you're when you're building your facility. You can really reduce your carbon footprint. You can reduce your energy usage just by, um, you know, selecting the right equipment, selecting Absolutely. the right technique. If you're going to go with a very high intensive, uh, high energy technique with a high intensity cooling, high intensity heating, um, it, you're going to have you're going to have uh, added requirements for your HVAC. You're going to have added requirements for. Um, you know, obviously your energy usage and how much it's, Absolutely. you know, a lot of that is and just happening. It's interesting in many of the larger uh, metro areas, you know, in, in New York, California, I Illinois, for example, mm -hmm. uh, they are giving credits because they can't generate more power. Right. They can't, they don't have the ability. Permitting to, to yeah. yes, exactly. exactly. So they have to buy it from outside their area. Give it a... Uh, or they can... 
give you credits for reducing your power footprint. Yeah, it's just an incentive to reduce it. Yeah, it makes sense. It does make sense. I mean, yeah. So when you're, when you're starting up, um, it's a really important that you really look at your energy usage. Absolutely. And, you know, that obviously becomes a part of your carbon footprint um, yep. altogether. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so, you know, it's, it's not like, uh, you know, ethanol is a bad way to go. It's just it's very energy intensive. Well, and, it's and costly, and it's yeah. still, you know, it's still kind of a standard out there mm -hmm. uh, because that's been, you know, there, there's a lot of embedded base. There's a lot of uh, familiarity with it, um, but it is highly energy high energy use right yeah, so. so let's also talk about the last topic which is uh, waste, generation. waste generation yeah so Ooh. that is a big deal okay like suppose i'm a um i'm a company and i'm doing a ton a day right sure. and i i'm losing five to you know four or five or maybe five or six percent of my ethanol to the the waste which is the raffinate right sure. is what they call it yep well um where does that raffinate go well, it goes outside or yeah. it goes into dumpster or whatever, yep. and then it's manifested. Some In some jurisdictions, I think they attempt to uh, basically manifest it as hazardous waste in some cases. It depends on what the solvent that's being used. If yep. it's IPA and acetone or hexane, I've, we've seen um, all kinds of things being used. Yep. Um, you know, you th that can become then a, hazardous, a, a hazardous waste. waste. Okay, sure. and <clears throat> there are rules of when it becomes hazardous and when it can be put into a landfill. Uh, but n nonetheless, uh, if you have all that five percent, that five percent is going to evaporate and become v volatile organic compounds (VOC). Yeah. So that's a something that a lot of those guys, uh, when when they look at uh, the VOC emissions from their plant. Um, you know, they're looking at, you know, reducing that VOC footprint, right? So, so let me ask you this. So based on that, <clears throat> if you're, can you use uh, biomass as compost it, with ethanol? No. With CO2, potentially? Potentially, yeah. Or you can just grind it up into powder and sell it as hemp protein. That'd be another thing to do. Oh, yeah. There's a um, lot of protein in there. Yeah, there's quite a bit. Um yeah, with ethanol, the problem with the ethanol in there is if, it, if first of all, if you're using denatured ethanol, Bad. then then you have then you have ethanol plus heptane or whatever recipe you're using. Sure, that's also in there. So yep. that's something that you know that becomes com complicated. Oh. Um, Interesting. But, but if you use CO2, um, you know the CO2 basically you know vents off 100 percent. There's nothing left in it. So, so there is no volatile organic compound in a CO2 compost. Right. So biomass. it could be composted. The ethanol might actually kill the bugs that are needed to grow the compost. Right. Oh well, that would be bad. Um, yeah. So I don't. I don't really know. I haven't ever composted ethanol. But, waste, but regardless, there's still it. that VOC. Yeah, it is a volatile right. organic compound at that point. You would want to dry it out before you composted it, and yeah. you know, and people aren't going to pay usually to dry that out. If they did pay, that would add to your energy usage, oh, yeah. and then it would also add to your carbon footprint because yeah. you're you're actually expending energy to remove the the ethanol from the waste. So it's 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 hazardous waste at that point. Yeah, I you know there are rules for when it becomes hazardous, and it, I think it has a, something to do with the percentage of uh, of, of the of it's how just much waste is in at there. That point. Yeah, it could be just waste. It could be hazardous waste if you have if you're using hexane and you well, know which some people do. Yeah, you know um, then you're you know then oh. definitely it can become that issue. So, wow. I feel so, so powerful awesome. with that, <laughs> <laughs> with that, uh, that was crescendo. I don't know if you could hear that, but that was a little bit of thunder going on out there. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Yeah. So anyway, so th those are the three things you guys need to be thinking about. Uh, c you know, lowering your carbon footprint, re reducing your energy By looking at usage. the energy to make it. Yeah, that's right. Energy usage mm -hmm. ongoing, and then the waste generation. And then the waste generation. Those are three real aspects. And I think that if you, you know, if you optimize those, you can you know from the very start you can really produce a much much lower carbon footprint if you get off on the right foot yeah but even if you are there there are ways to offset that ongoing because even if you've started here you can always migrate over and i'm seeing that happening time and time again uh even with many of the ethanol producers out there 
you're buying, you know, something that is really cool. I mean, we have a Fractron that we ma manufacture, mm -hmm. which is a giant, um, it mo removes a lot of solvent, uh, up right. to 40 gallons an hour. But it's fast. also energy intensive. But it is, it is energy intensive, but it's in fast bursts. Yeah. It's bursting. It's not an ongoing where it's over time and time and time. Because if you're running 12 <laughs> rotovaps, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, there's, you're yeah. Well, there's a lot less energy loss uh, with go. that. Yeah. So your your HVAC would be because yeah. everything's insulated, yep. and you don't have like an open uh, open vessel yep. with you know that's that's boiling or hot there. Yeah, but you can do up to forty gallons an hour with the Fractron versus five gallons over four and a half hours with a rotovac. Right. Right. But yeah. it's it's smaller. But anyway, the but there's a lot of things that you can do to offset that. Yeah. That. Uh, BTU charge generation insulation you carbon know, footprint. Um, yeah, I mean with the rotovaps, you know that was always a thing. I mean you can use oil in the bowl right. instead of water. Yeah, but most people just use water. Yeah. Um, you know you can um, you can do that, but you know most people just use water. And then obviously in your room, then it's, it's just humid in there, right? It's not very fun to I work I can only in imagine there. pulling out that bowl <laughs> with that globe when with, with, all, with, all with, the oil. with water is hard enough when you got oil on yeah, it. Yeah, right? it's just terrible. That's yeah. a lot of a lot of breaking glass. Yeah, what exactly. That? That's I, don't the, I don't know. This one? No, no, not that <laughs> one. No. <laughs> oh, we, we picked up our buttons. So. Yeah, okay. Somebody added more, uh, more sound effect buttons. But this is cool. So we're talking about carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. We're talking about reducing or being aware of the energy it, it, to make your right. product, uh, the energy usage on an ongoing basis, and then the waste generation to uh, to really take a look and be aware of your carbon footprint. Yeah. The other thing <coughs> on the whole usage factor uh, with ethanol is something that I think is, a, is, is going to be a much bigger deal in the future, and that is all the GMP rules related to um, reuse of ethanol. Oh, yeah. A lot of people are just using it again and again and again, and quite honestly, the ethanol gets janky, okay? It's, it starts to and that's build up contamination. In fact, the, the first time you term. use it, it's, it's got contaminants in yeah. it, and you do that again and again. Well, the FDA has recognized that it's, it's beneficial to, um, to, to be able to reuse solvents because they don't want to just discard it every time. Right. But there are rules associated with that, and there's also a validation that's required to say, okay, this is how many times we can use it before we can't really recover it back to its original state. And um, that's just some enforcement that hasn't happened yet, because but it's, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen because the original language was you had to bring it back to its original state before you could reuse well, it. Well, that is the language right now. That is the guidance. You have to bring it back to its an original state. Right. Which means, uh, which means, you know, if you're distilling, yeah. th that that will help. But there's a lot of co-distillation, so it's not perfect. Yeah. You anybody who's distilled, you know, ethanol, yeah. can kind of say, oh, it's off color. What is all that stuff? Well, you throw it into your a gas chromatograph, and you'll be able to see all that stuff in there, right? But even so if you distill it, you still can't take out all the water, correct? Um, well, yeah, you can. There's there's some eutectics and stuff, and that that's oh. the the issue there. I'm sorry, um, you'll you'll get this emulsion uh, uh, associated sure. with that. Yeah, it's a loss, yeah. right? It's a loss of the ethanol. So okay. Uh, so in the recovery, you're actually losing the ethanol. Wow. Okay. So mm. I don't know. So this is something also that. You know, if you say, okay, look, well, we can use, th we can reuse this uh, 10 times, okay? What that means is that you're going to have to, if you have, you know, if it's 10 gallons per one pound, mm -hmm. okay, and you're doing, say, 1,000 gallons and you're, you're recycling that, yep. and you're, you're going to use it 10 or 15 times, that's uh, a pretty big loss of ethanol per unit time. Sure. So you bet. people are looking at, oh, well, we're just going to use this forever, and then it you get contaminant built up in that, right? Yeah. So the GMP people, they just haven't really gotten to the enforcement of that particular uh, aspect of it yet, yep. I don't think. And no. but it's coming. Yeah. So look at we've done some other podcasts uh, uh, with the residuals and what's in there, and yeah. So take a look at those as well. And that has to do a lot to do with sustain sustainability because if you if you can really can use the solvent forever and you just keep on recycling it forever and ever and ever and contamination and cross contamination doesn't matter, um, you know it's it's really great. That's how most of the operators operate right now. Gotcha. Okay, um, people who are GMP, 
uh, people who are following GMP rules, they're not, and they're, they're not supposed to be doing that. They're supposed to be validating how many times they use it, when the contamination becomes uh, unrecoverable, and mm -hmm. also assessing the risk as to you know, how much that is. When you do that, you are necessarily going to be changing out your ethanol more which necessarily increases your carbon footprint. So this has, been, this has been a great episode. Yeah. Thank you. Well done. Talk about yeah. carbon footprint. Be aware. Uh, g get on it. You know, just be aware where you're at. Yeah. And this was great. Well done. All right. Sounds good. Virtual table. Man. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time. Yeah, take care. Bye now. Are you stuck in your hemp or cannabis business? Are you not reaching your processing goals? Here at Extract Lab, we offer a free 20-minute CBD jam session. A CBD jam session is a conversation with an industry expert, not a sales call. A conversation where you can talk to us about whatever issues you are having right now and where you are stuck. We will help you uncover any issues you are currently having in your business, create a solution to fit your current scale, develop a future scale-up plan based on your needs, and help you make your processing goals a reality all while getting your business plan back on track. Schedule your free 20-minute CBD Jam session at 1-651-600-0036. Again, that number is 1-651-600-0036.